are so pleased today to welcome Professor Lorena Marcus, who teaches Chicana Chicano history courses in the Department of Chicana Chicano Studies at UC Davis. She will be discussing her new book, which traces the rise of the Chicana Chicano movement in Sacramento in the role of everyday people in galvanizing a collective to seek lasting and transformative change during the 1960s and 1970s civil rights era. In their efforts to be self-determined, La Gente contested multiple forms of oppression at school, at work sites, and in their communities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Marcus. Thank you so much for that introduction, Marty. I'm so very pleased to be with you today, and um, I'm happy uh, to share a little bit of my journey in terms of writing this book. La Gente Struggles for Empowerment and Community Self-Determination in Sacramento. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start my, um, my apologies. I'm going to start my PowerPoint. I have no idea where it went. All right, so um, let's just go ahead and get started. So um, when I went to graduate school, I actually got the question a lot about why I wanted to write about Sacramento and why it was important. And so um, at first I was a little annoyed by the question because the, I'm like, why not <laughs> Sacramento? I felt like um, there was a story that needed to be tell, told, and so um, that was part of my sort of journey in terms of my beginnings with archival research and uh, becoming a history student, uh, is that there was nothing written at the time on Mexicans in Sacramento, not one article, not one book, uh, not one chapter in a book, and I knew that there was an existence uh, of Mexicans in the area that trace back to the um, California gold rush. And yet uh, that story had not been told. And as an undergraduate student, I was very active in an organization called MECHA, which stands for Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan or Chicano Student Movement of Aslan. And it was through my activism that I was able to organized with Chicano movement elders in Sacramento. Many of them were professors at Sac State. And um, so I knew that there was a rich history there because I learned it from them. They were my professors at this university. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, Sacramento is located as the state capital, of course, um, and it's located in what is known as uh, Northern California, uh, just kind of shy of Central California. Uh, and the way that I look at it in my book is I look at the greater Sacramento region, which includes several counties. I think especially for the time period that I focus on, which is the 1960s, it's important to look at Sacramento as sort of this larger uh, region and it being really the center or the hub. And that includes um, the counties that are listed here. Uh, and so for instance, I found in my study that a lot of folks would come into Sacramento to go to mass, to church, um, to dances, uh, to shop. And so it became a place where folks gathered uh, from outside counties and sort of, um, it, it just sort of uh, connected the area. And so my book argues that the Chicana Chicano movement can be understood as a transformative era that engaged everyday people to participate in national and even international struggles over civil rights. I argue that La Gente were principal agents of resistance and constantly negotiated acts of defiance, especially when their lives, the lives of their children and their livelihoods or households were at risk. 
And so what I try to do is rather than to look at major Chicana Chicano movement icons, events, or organizations, I try to look at every what I call everyday folk uh, or la gente. Uh, and I try to bring them into uh, the historiography and um, and I argue that they're history makers and that you can't really think about a social movement without bringing in uh, these voices. And so that's what my book tries to do. And so what is La Gente? Um, I define it as working class folks, males and females, US born and foreign born, documented and undocumented whose lives were largely governed and anchored in work and the protection of their families. Indeed, the everyday work of reproducing a viable and enriched life require that they focus on earning a living rather than fully partake in a social movement. So as I am looking at um, everyday folks or uh, la gente, I acknowledge uh, in the book that activism looks differently for everyday people because they can't quit their jobs and dedicate themselves uh, full time to a social movement. And so we have an uneven process of activism. And even though that process is uneven, it's very important, I think, for us to recognize that even folks who, um, you know, who went to work and who did all of these things were still participants and active agents in uh, social change for the Chicano Chicano movement. And so my book is organized uh, by four major chapters. I have the first uh, chapter looks at community building and it really sets it from pre, um, pre-colonial times uh, to uh, the 1960s. Uh, and then I have a chapter on desegregation, which I will be focusing on today for today's talk. I also have a, a chapter on cannery workers and a chapter on the establishment of, the Chica, of a Chicana Native American Community College on the outskirts of Davis, California. So um, that's the makeup of the book. And in terms of my analysis for uh, each chapter, I always tried to bring in class, race and ethnicity, gender, concepts of self-determination, what it meant to build on community and of course, always looking at resistance, how everyday people are resisting oppression. And then I challenge notions of activism and leadership in the way that they've been traditionally defined as mostly men uh, taking to the microphone or folks that are covered in newspapers usually tend to be men in this time period. And so I'm really trying to challenge those notions of leadership and activism. Uh, I take the cue here from African American scholars who have written extensively on uh, the civil rights uh, movement. And uh, I, I take their approach, which is known as the long civil rights era. And one of the things I do in this, in this book is I look at how Mexicans have um, engaged uh, civic and um, political activism over a long period of time, stretching as far back as the 1900, early 1900s uh, with the establishment of different organizations, one being uh, um, La Alianza Hispanoamericana, which is a mutual aid organization. And here you see a picture of, um, of the chapter here in Sacramento in 1929. So this is what uh, chapter one really tries to build on, right? Um, and I think it's important, especially for current, you know, young people, current generations to look at that activism doesn't just happen overnight. It's been building over decades and sometimes centuries. Uh, and so it's important for us to look at those early periods because they're all foundational. Um, So by the 1950s, uh, television played a central role, I think, um, in civil rights, because uh, for the first time ever, Americans all over uh, are 
watching television, and they, are, they actually own a television. In fact, by 1958, 83% of all US households owned a television. And so that made it so that folks were engaging, uh, were looking at uh, what was happening, for instance, in the American South with this African-American civil rights movement. And they were able to see images like these, right? These images that are now very popular that uh, you know, we, we all sort of associate with civil rights. But here we see, for instance, uh, black youth demonstrating in a sit-in and they're clearly not attacking anyone. They're, they've been put placed on the ground. They've had their, they have their hands behind their heads as shown here and a water hose, um, a pressure a water hose is being sprayed on them even as they are not a threat. Uh, on the right here, you can see a 17 year old boy who uh, is attacked by police. Again, a peaceful demonstrator. And these images are being delivered all over the US through television sets, not the radio, right? And so people are actually seeing uh, the ways in which uh, African-Americans are being attacked. And this strikes a chord um, with many who begin to sympathize with, Af with the African-American civil rights movement. And Chicanas and Chicanos are not exempt to that. Uh, indeed, many of them were watching uh, these, uh, the civil unrest unfold in real time. And they were uh, sympathizing, but also uh, coming to terms with their own oppression based on race and ethnicity. And they began to challenge, to challenge these, uh, these oppressions. And so the Chicana Chicano movement was very much inspired by the African American civil rights movement. And I also think that uh, scholars tend to not focus much on this, but I think it's really important for us to call attention to what motivated the Chicana Chicano movement. And so the Chicana Chicano movement begins in 1965 when Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, uh, which is a name we know very well, Cesar Chavez, we have um, a state holiday actually on the 31st of this month, March, uh, to commemorate uh, Cesar Chavez, a union leader, farm worker leader, the first Chicano um, to brace the cover of uh, People Magazine, which back then everyone subscribed to People Magazine. It was a very popular uh, magazine. And he, um, I believe, made the cover in 1966, is uh, what I'm re remembering. And so when they launched the, uh, the farm workers uh, uh, movement from Delano, California, which is in the Central Valley, uh, they indeed launched what is known as the Chicana Chicano movement. And the irony there, of course, is that Cesar Chavez did not identify as a Chicana, uh, a Chicano, I'm sorry. He identified as a Mexican American. He was very much of that generation of the 1940s. He had served in the US Navy at the age of 17. And so he never uh, identified as a Chicano yet. He is credited for beginning the Chicano movement. So many of you may be asking, well, what makes the Chicana Chicano movement unique? Well, I think one of the first things you have to sort of take into consideration is that the Chica uh, Chicanas and Chicanos have, share a history of colonization. They were colonized twice, first by the Spanish and then by the Americans. Uh, uh, Spain, uh, or I should say Hernán Cortés landed uh, in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in 1519. And then we have what is known as the Mexican-American War, uh, which begins in um, 1846. Uh, we also have the use of the language uh, Spanish, uh, which is a symbol of cultural pride and is used, as you can see, even here in these uh, pictures, excuse me, um, you also have this, uh, the proximity to Mexico. And so you have a constant replenishment of immigrants that keep the culture, the language, 
intact and vibrant. We also have um, the revival of indigenous roots and this connection to the ancestral land, uh, claiming, for instance, uh, the concept of Aslan, where the Aztecs originated from. And, um, and um, you also have the establishment or the self-label of Chicanas and Chicanos. This is a label that was um, self-ascribed in the 1960s. And so it wasn't a label that was assigned to them. It was a label that they themselves um, assigned. Okay, so chapter two is uh, what I will be focusing on today. And um, it looks at a desegregation case of an elementary school called Washington Elementary School. And um, in the US, uh, there was a sort of battle to desegregate in the aftermath of the Brown versus Board of Education of 1954. And um, what we know is that for ethnic Mexicans, especially, um, there has been a very sort of strong position to segregation. And I'll talk about that next. The first case that dealt with uh, segregation was actually in 1931 in the Alvarez versus Lemon Grove case. And here in Lemon Grove, California, which is in San Diego County, uh, the Southern part of the state, uh, you had a, a, a school board, the Lemon Grove School Board, who decides that they are going to be segregating the Mexicans from the, what is they call the white the white or Caucasian uh, kids. And um, on January 5th, uh, 1931, the principal of that school, Jerome Green, uh, tells all the Mexican kids to wait outside. They can't enter the school building. And they said, look, we've built a new school for you and this is where you're going to go. And they said, well, you know, they didn't even notify the parents. They basically just blocked the kids from entering the school. And so they were gonna send them to uh, a barn, which it used to be a horse barn and that was their new school supposedly. Well, the kids didn't go to the school, they went home and they told their parents and then the parents uh, resisted, uh, you know, this uh, Mexican school, they called them Mexican schools back then. And the court ruled that uh, you cannot segregate Mexicans because they were not of the quote, Negro, Mongolian, or Indian races. And the segregation violated the state law. And how does this happen to be, right? So I'd have to take you back, um, you know, a century or so. Uh, when the Mexican American War ended, that uh, they signed a treaty, and in that treaty, they made Mexicans uh, US citizens, uh, those Mexicans who resided on this side of the border, US citizens. And at the time, right, this predates the Civil War, uh, no one could be a citizen unless you were white. Um, and so that's how Mexicans became legally white. And so the law then saw Mexicans as legally white socially, they were not treated as white. They were treated as a racial minority. And they were segregated just like African-Americans had been segregated in the American South. So in this instance then, Mexicans win uh, their case and uh, they're able to keep their kids at this grammar school. And then in the 1940s, uh, oops, we have uh, the Lemon Grove case. And uh, here, I'm sorry, not the Lemon Grove case, Mendez versus Westminster. Uh, Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez uh, were landowners and uh, they wanted to send their kids to uh, the local school, but that school was designed for whites only. And so they want, the school, the school said, hey, you, could, you can go send your kids to the Mexican school. And Gonzalo was very appalled, like, what are you talking about? My kids are 
this is their school, this is where they belong. And so um, I'm gonna send my kids here. Uh, and so in 1945, uh, Gonzalo Mendez, along with four other plaintiffs, filed a suit against four school districts in Southern California, Westminster, Garden Grove, Santa Ana, and El Modena. And um, they argued that you know, uh, Mexicans should not be segregated because they were not a racial minority and they, could, they should be able to attend the white schools. Well, the, the school districts was, were arguing that in fact, uh, they were not being segregated because of race, but they were being segregated because of language. So, um, but they found that a lot of the kids who were attending the Mexican schools didn't even speak Spanish. And so that was just a, a fault of, you know, sort of false statement um, to make the kids go to the Mexican schools and not to the white schools. And again, here uh, you have a judge rule that uh, segregation was illegal, uh, that it violated the state law. And during this uh, case, we actually had the, for the first time, sociologists and psychologists uh, I'm, social, I'm sorry, social scientists and psychologists testify and argue the negative effects of segregation. This is the first time ever in which you have um, psychologists argue that this causes uh, psychological harm to kids to put them in segregated schools. And um, they win their case. Uh, and so Mexicans are kids are allowed to attend these, um, the white schools in these school districts, okay. So then we have uh, Brown versus Board of Education of 1954. And as you know, this is a pretty uh, famous case that ruled that segregation was not um, legal, that it, that, you know, it, we needed to undo uh, segregation, um, but it took a very, very long time for this to happen. I mean, something like 20 plus years before schools, school districts started to tackle desegregation. And so I'm gonna turn your attention now to the Washington Elementary case. And so I was doing archival research at the Center for Sacramento History, and um, I learned about this uh, fight um, that was taking place for Washington Elementary. And I had read about it in the newspapers, you know, the in 1968, and I was kind of trying to figure out what was happening. And I didn't really understand why Mexican parents were fighting to, to keep the school segregated, to not desegregate. Uh, and I didn't understand how this could be if civil rights, if progress entailed desegregation and what was happening in Sacramento was very different from what was happening in Southern California where you have Mexican parents sue school districts to desegregate. And so I learned that in 1963, an African-American father and also president of the NAACP board um, sued Sacramento City Unified School District because it had not implemented Brown versus Board of Education. And he won his lawsuit uh, and the court ordered Sacramento City Unified School District to begin the desegregation of African-American and Mexican students. The school board um, noted that it would deal first with African-Americans and then wait on desegregating Mexican students because they see, they called it the Mexican problem. It was more complex, they argued due to language. And so desegregating Mexican students would be a lot more difficult. So in 1964, they began to desegregate African-American students and then uh, it wasn't until 1968 that the plan would take place to begin desegregation of Mexican schools, one of them being Washington Elementary. And um, 
So the parents at Washington Elementary, mostly Mexican parents, um, decided to host a special meeting to decide whether they wanted to desegregate Washington or if they wanted to remain segregated. 560 voted against desegregation, 15 voted for, desegre um, for desegregation. That means that 97%, 97% wanted to keep Washington Elementary and not to desegregate the school. And so the question is, why would they, why would they want to keep Washington segregated? Well, they made very compelling arguments, right? Uh, they argued that uh, the school was uh, culturally sensitive, that um, it catered to the needs of the population. Parents were very much um, excited, for instance, to be able to go to the uh, celebrations that were taking place as the, at the school such as Cinco de Mayo celebrations, 16 de Septiembre, so on and so forth. They also argued that they really liked the fact that bilingual, there was a bilingual staff there available for them who spoke their language and could communicate easily with them. They were afraid that their kids would uh, face racism if they left uh, Washington Elementary. They were also afraid that uh, their kids would be laughed at because of their uh, class standing, that they didn't have you know, the fancy clothes and the fancy shoes and that they would be um, bullied at this new schools. Um, and so they made these arguments and you know, in hindsight, I think when I was doing the research, instead of being so like taken aback by the stance that the parents were taking, I never really considered the fact that Washington Elementary could serve such an important role in the community. For instance, in the evenings, they offer English language courses to the parents and adults in the neighborhood. They also had a Head Start program that was very successful uh, that ran in the summers. Uh, of course, this is a free federal program. Uh, now I know, since I have my own kids, right, that you pay an arm and a leg for childcare um, <laughs> in the summer. Um, in fact, my husband and I are budgeting for that now. Um, and so I understood the position that the parents took and I understood that they were afraid for their kids. They also argued that why was busing, um, you know, placed on the shoulders of students of color? How come only, brown and black kids are being bused out of the school and white kids are not being bused anywhere, right? Who is, um, who has to shoulder that burden? And so they were making very compelling arguments. Sacramento City Unified School District uh, decides to move forward with desegregation regardless of uh, Mexican parents uh, resisting uh, segregation, I'm sorry, desegregation. They argue that Washington Elementary did not uh, fulfill the earthquake standards. And so they began to bus kids uh, in September 10 of 1968. Uh, and desegregation lasts until 1971, until the school is physically demolished, uh, as you can see here in this picture. And so the parents lose the case for Washington Elementary and um, they find uh, a year after uh, desegregation takes place that the children's uh, test scores did not improve. So, um, you know, these, these are good questions to ask, right? So why have desegregation if there's no improvement in their education um, in, in terms of standardized testing? So, this is a, a slide that I like to share with my students. Um, when we look at the Chicana Chicano movement, I think that there's lessons that we can learn, right, to move forward. Number one, I think that 
uh, in the 1960s, everything was sort of coached around white people are the enemy. And in the 1960s, I don't think people understood what white supremacy meant, right? That white supremacy is a system in which it oppresses people of color. And so that is the enemy, not white people, right? Uh, racism was not in, understood as institutional. Uh, in the 1960s, everybody's white who's in positions of power. The police force is white. The school board is white. All the politicians are white. And so I think in the 1960s, it was just like, let's just get more people of color in these positions. But if you don't change the institution that causes racism, then you're not changing. That's not enough to make lasting change, right? Um, homophobia was not taken as a central community issue. And so unfortunately for, for folks who were queer, identify as gay or lesbian, uh, that was not a central cause during the Chicana Chicano movement. Those folks had to wait quite a while before they got any sort of recognition. Uh, and I think proper placement, right, in any, in any social movement. Mm -hmm. Also, I think leaders were often viewed as male and make, makeshift messiahs, not seen as complicated and flawed individuals, right? And so that's always problematic, even I think to the present day where we think about, you know, that whatever we see as leaders, they're not flawed. And that's just not even possible because we're all human. Um, also, I think in the 1960s, individuals became spokesperson for entire racial groups. And that's not correct. That's not the way we should do things, right? Because no racial group is monolithic politically, uh, definitely not the case. And I think even today we can look at the example of, of the Chicana Latino uh, population and make that those clear distinctions between political affiliation. Um, I also think that in the 1960s, identity politics uh, were toxic. Uh, they were often seen as fixed or non-intersectional. Um, there was always questions about who was legitimate Chicana or Chicano. If you didn't speak Spanish, you couldn't be Chicano, for instance. If your parents weren't immigrants, then you weren't Chicano enough, on and on and on. And I don't think that this is um, unique to the Chicana, Chicano population, right? This is what happens in many uh, racial ethnic groups. I think it's also important for us not to romanticize the movement because no movement is perfect. And so we can't just say, you know, the, that the Chicana Chicano movement gave us all of these things and it never made any mistakes. We need to look at the flaws because I think in looking at the flaws, that's where you, you learn the most. Um, I also think that there are personal costs to le leadership and some of them are devastating. Right, and so what I mean by that is like, if we look at the models of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, I mean, they could barely feed their family and they had very large families. Um, we're looking at seven, eight kids. I think Dolores Huerta had 11 kids. Um, she couldn't afford to have a home, to have you know regular um, childcare. And so she was often asking folks to watch her kids while she lobbied and so on and so forth. There are many, many instances, I think, if you look in the 1960s of what the true personal costs are, but we don't focus on that, I think, because uh, we don't wanna know that part. We just wanna know the good stuff, right? Um, and yeah, that concludes my talk for today. Uh, this is my information if you wanna send me an email and um, I'm gonna stop share so we can start the Q&A. Oh, wow. Professor Marquez, thank you so much for giving us your time and giving us your experience and your all your knowledge on this subject. We really appreciate all of that. So let's see. Let's read some of these questions. Oh, a great first one, I think, to start us off. Um, 
Someone's curious about the distinction between La Raza and La Gente. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's a good question. I would just say that, you know, there, there probably isn't that much of a distinction, except that I um, am defining it as working class. And La Raza means the people uh, as well, like literally La Gente, but I'm defining it as working class in my book. Do you, can you speak to why one spoke to you more than the other? That's a good or question. Um, <laughs> I think the term La Raza has also been very politicized. Um, and it has, it has, I don't want to get into too deep of the history, but it has um, a deep connection to La Raza Cosmica, which was a nationalistic call in Mexico in the late 1800s. And it was supposed to be a blending of indigenous and Spanish roots, uh, like a perfect almost blend. And so the, it's problematic in itself because there was a huge push to, um, to, to, for this concept of La Raza Cosmica as its perfect blend. And we know that there's indigenous populations that were never touched by Europeans. So that's not a, a true definition. So that's why I kind of geared away from that. Okay, thank you. Um, someone has asked about, um, where did the term Latin X come around? And I know that at times we also saw the term uh, Chican X, Ch Chican X. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about both of those. Yeah, so the term Latin X is a, fair, a fairly recent term. I would say within the last 10, 15 years, it's a term that was usually, I'm sorry, mostly used by um, college students. And I think what happened is in the aftermath of the 1960s, uh, we kind of got a little bit of a pushback with to the term Chicana Chicano because folks were saying, you know, not everybody's Mexican. And so I think that was accounting for the diversity in uh, the Latino population. You're looking at Central American, Puerto Rican, Mexican, you know, all of those are very, um, have their own history. And so I, uh, it's an umbrella term. And then the the X at the end is to do away with the A and the O of uh, uh, male and female. In Spanish, A is for female, O, if a word ends in O, it's for male, usually. Uh, and the X then includes uh, um, folks who don't identify as male or female, uh, have um, different gender and so I think that's important to account for. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, let's see. So you gave us a nice slide about lessons learned and someone is wondering if you could speak to in your mind, what are some contributions or benefits to furthering Latinx people's rights that, that, that are still seen today? Like a, a highlight reel, if you will. Yes, yes. So I owe my job <laughs> to the Chicana Chicano movement as a Chicana Chicano studies professor who does Chicana Chicano history. Um, so that would be number one. Uh, I think also um, when you look at the number of college students, um, as we move our, they call it HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutes, those continue to increase. So Back in the 1960s, you're looking maybe at 3%, 7% Chicana Chicano students, and that is now ballooned to over 20. So the Chicana Chicano movement absolutely um, opened the doors, I think, for colleges um, and for the study of uh, this population. And I'm also thinking of all, all sorts of sort of um, social service agencies. Uh, in Sacramento, we have the establishment of La Familia founded by a, a Chicana uh, and, you know, there's all of these sort of connections. I think you had the opening of um, folks entering uh, politics. Mm. I mean, that there's, there, it just really forced the door to open. Um, so I think we're all benefiting from this era. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Um, 
that I'm trying to frame what you just said sparked a question and I'm trying to see if I can wrap it well. I'll come back to that. Um, this person's question reminded me of my own question. Um, would you say, can you talk about any improvements that you've seen in your own time of working in the Chicano Chicana um, academic field, um, growth that you've seen there in your own time? Um, besides a bunch of scholarship <laughs> uh, okay. books, including my, my own, um, I mean, the, the field has just really opened up, uh, you know, even when I was a college student, you didn't have as many publications come out. Um, I'm also, I'm not really sure how to answer your question, but I'm just thinking in terms of my, for myself, um, I've had the opportunity to do an oral history archive, to participate in that. We have 98 oral interviews of Chicanas and Chicano elders in the Sacramento region. And so, you know, I think that it's an important time because you know, that, that generation's aging and we need to get their histories mm -hmm. and um, really understand uh, how they revolutionized uh, academia. Yeah, now that beautifully answered my question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we have a couple questions about Cesar Chavez and um, Dolores Huertas. Huerta. Huerta. Mm -hmm. Huerta. Um, so one is asking, was the movement in Sacramento um, Oh, excuse me. Uh, someone recollected that uh, Cesar Chavez was primarily a labor leader rather than a social activist. And he's wondering, is that correct? And that links into another question of, was the movement in Sacramento an organized movement or was it more p individuals taking individual action? Um, okay, so for the first question, yes, Cesar Chavez, I would um, make the argument as well that he was a labor activist. That's how he saw himself. So I think that's how we need to see him as well. He did inspire, though, a generation of Chicana Chicano movement leaders, activists. Uh, you know, he made national, international news in a time where no one even knew we existed. Everything was on a black, white binary. Uh, no one, it, unless you lived in California, you didn't really understand that there was, you know, other races that were being oppressed. Uh, and so he opened up, I think that Pandora's box for folks to make claims. And of course, people look at him, he's a brown man, uh, looks like us, you know? And so very much that connection was made, especially I think the youth uh, identified with, um, with them. You know, and the interesting thing is in the 1960s, the Chicana Chicano population is mostly urban. They live in uh, large urban areas like LA. They're not really farm workers. That's a minority. Uh, yet everybody sort of sympathize with farm workers. And so I think that's also important for us to consider. And then okay. the second question was about Sacramento being, if it was unified or... Yeah. Or was it more individual, a bunch of individuals taking action in their way? Um, I would say it was both. Yeah, yeah. So okay. one of the things I, I look at in the book is, for instance, I have a chapter on cannery workers. No one had written about cannery workers in the Chicano Chicano movement. And yet I found this case here in Sacramento where you had, you know, everyday people, la gente, working class, I mean, you can't be more racially uh, marginalized uh, workforce than cannery workers. And they're identifying with the Chicana Chicano movement. They founded their own newspaper, they founded their own union, they're connecting to this larger. So here you have, you know, the, this workplace that balloons and then you have unions forming all over Sacramento and actually Northern California, the County Workers Committee. And they're, they're, they're doing their own thing within the cannery workers, but they're also calling, for instance, on the Royal Chicano Air Force to do their art. Um, they're doing presentations with uh, some of the major Chicano, Chicano movement uh, leaders at the time, like, uh, um, Oh my God, I'm forgetting his name, the boxer. Anyway, I'm forgetting his name. He's from Denver. Um, 
he comes into town and he gives a speech. So there's these ways in which they intersect, but they're also very much engaged in their own sort of plights across the city, I think. Yeah. Um, there's someone asking, because you mentioned that you define La Gente as um, the, the people, the working people. Um, were marches or, or events or, or anything like that in our area, were they specifically organized around work days? Um, did, did they factor that in? Is there evidence of that? Um, that's a good question. The first thing that I'm, I'm thinking of is the cover of my book. It actually shows the march of the UFW coming in from Delano to Sacramento to the state capitol. And that took place on Easter Sunday. Um, and so that's why you have, you know, tens of thousands of folks out there. Um, yeah, so I, I'm sure that that helped um, mm -hmm. folks. But I'm sure there was moments where people would take days off work or call in sick or what have you um, if they needed to attend something. I just don't have um, those specific examples with, um, to, to say one or the other. Okay. Um, circling back to Cesar Chavez, um, how did Chavez and Huerta first meet? You said they're kind of co-leaders at the time. Yeah, they met, they met in San Jose when they were both uh, organizing with the Cal uh, community service organization. Uh, and that's where they met in San Jose. I believe it was 62. And then they leave that organization and they uh, make their way, their way to Delano to organize farm workers. Because the, the uh, community service organization is a really uh, famous uh, organization in ethnic Mexican communities, actually founded in Chicago where you have a large number of Mexicans there. Um, and it comes to, to LA and also to Sacramento and other places like San Jose. And, but it was really based on urban issues and. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta wanted to organize farm workers. And that's why they leave the CSO and they founded the National Farm Workers Association, later becomes the United Farm Workers Union. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Um, someone has asked, can you discuss the effects of the Lau versus Nichols Supreme Court case and the different California bilingual education programs? I am um, not that familiar where I would be able to talk at length about that. Okay. All right, let me see. We're, get, we're getting some, some as we're talking here. So let me see what I found. Are you noticing another kind of more current uh, question? Are you noticing the political landscape of today really jeopardizing any specific area of the progress that has been made by the Chicano or Chicana movement over the past 60 years? Not understanding the question, if I'm... Um, the political landscape of today. The kind of talking about the polarity, the extremes of one side and the other. Do you feel like that is getting in the way of any any of this progress that you've spent the last last several minutes uh, telling us about? And I can move on if this if this isn't working. Um, yeah, I don't know who asked that question. Maybe they need to be a little bit more specific. Um, I don't necessarily think we're we're going back um, because these programs have been instituted for over 50 years in some cases. If we look at the establishment of Chicana Chicano studies, I don't see that disappearing. Um, I think there are social service agencies. I think that are growing and are getting more funding. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, off the top of my head of La Familia and they got a lot of funding uh, during COVID 
I know I took my dad to get, um, you know, their, their first, uh, COVID, um, their shots, their, um, COVID shots, and they provided all of those services for free to the community. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's still stuff that, that, um, that I think is, is growing and is positive. Okay. I don't see it as being stalled or going backwards. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> um, so you spoke a little bit about your research process and visiting the archives for, for your book. Um, and, and I'm sorry if, if I missed it, but did you do any interviews for your book? Were there many? How, how, what was that process like? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I did interviews. I don't know how many I did, maybe 15, 12, I can't remember. Um, so that process was great. I mean, I was able to fill in the blank uh, in terms of the archival records are very limited. And so sometimes you can't get people's personal narratives, uh, especially uh, the voices of women, I think, are often uh, excluded in the archival record. And so having access to interviews um, and folks kind of knew me because I had been around, you know, as an undergrad and there was recommendations that were made on my behalf. And so I was able to access a lot of folks, I think, that enriched my, my book. Hmm. Do you feel like, was there one person, you know, throughout history, there's that question of if you could have anyone at your your favorite dinner table, anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Was there anyone you wish you could have interviewed for the book that pops up in your head? I don't think so. <laughs> hey, that's good to hear too. Then it's a different book. <laughs> there you go. Oh, well, that ties into another question we had. Um, so if you could choose the next step to be taken after your book. Like, um, it sounds like w when someone's writing a research paper, uh, they do at the end, they do the further research, might want to tackle this, this, and this. So if you could choose the next step when someone has taken your book and then they jump off of that point and they jump into the next pool, if you could choose that, what would it be? Yeah, um, I think that I just, you know, it's just one study, it's one book. And so I would love to see multiple books, maybe focusing on the 40s, mm. maybe even the 90s, um, you know, even the 60s, if someone wants to say, you know, you're way off, go for it. Um, I welcome, I welcome that. Uh, yeah, I just think it's just one study. I mean, I couldn't get everybody's um, story. And so I think that you know, I understand that there's limitations to my book. I don't think it's the book on Chicanas and Chicanos. I think it's a book. Okay. Uh, and then one of our people has heard of the great news that you just obtained tenure. Can you speak about the uh, journey to get that and how has that changed your life? And a big congratulations on that from several people. <laughs> uh, and I think so this will be the, our last question, so. Yes, how did I attain? <laughs> Just tell us about your journey. <laughs> I think I started graduate school at uh, my PhD program at 26. And so that was a long time. It was eight years. Uh, and then it took me five years to get a tenure track job. And then um, another five years um, to um, write the book. So yeah, it's been, I don't know, I think I was counting over like 20 years of research and writing. Um, what was the what was the question that was yeah it was just it was just generally talking about your journey to tenure with the the ups yeah. and downs the the joys <laughs> yeah so one of my personal missions is, as you saw on my first slide is that i wanted to record these histories i felt like sacramento had a lot to offer i'm uh i'm always trying to champion local history um, everybody's history is important. Every region in, in this country has something to offer. And if you believe in that, I think it can carry you all the way to tenure. And um, I, I'm just very fortunate that I was able to write the book. 
And, um, and I knew it was a step I needed to do anyway to get tenure. And so being at, at the side, you know, on this end, I feel like I've arrived. It feels amazing. I can continue my work. Um, yeah, so overall, I'm just very, very happy and I'm happy to share my work. I hope you all found it, you know, interesting and um, shoot me an email if you have any specific questions I wasn't able to address. Yeah, we, we got plenty, so we were not able to address them all. So thank you so much for your time. And it is now uh, going back to Marty for us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Marcus, for a very thought-provoking presentation. As a small thank you gift, we'd like to offer you an honorary membership in the Renaissance Society. And we'll also be making a donation in your name to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. Today's presentation was recorded. You can view it in two separate ways on the Renaissance Society forum channel on YouTube or from the Renaissance website. Next week, I hope you can join us as we welcome Jamie Lau, Clinical Professor of Law at Duke Law School. He's the supervising attorney for the Duke Law Wrongful Convictions Clinic and faculty advisor to the school's Innocence Project. Professor Lau is the 2021 recipient of the North Carolina Advocates for Justice Kelly Crabtree Award for his successful exoneration of a wrongfully convicted client. He will address the difficulties exonerees face as their new freedom begins, as well as the systemic flaws leading to wrongful convictions. So thank you for your attendance today, and we hope to see you next week.